Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Euphoric, the podcast. And I'm super excited to bring on our guest today. Leah, how are you doing? I'm so good. Thank you so much for having me. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. This is one of my favorite things to do in the day. So I'm super excited about this. But can you share a little bit with the listeners about who you are, what you do for a living, how you help people? Um, And then we'll go kind of into your story about how you change your relationship with alcohol. Yeah, sounds great. So thanks again for having me. My name is Leah. I am a an entrepreneur. I have an online business. I am a coach for entrepreneurs, specifically specializing in marketing and mindset. I have quite the entrepreneurial story. My now seven-figure business started as a blog. That was something I really just started in my mid twenties when I was kind of going through a quarter life crisis. Uh, I thought I wanted to go to law school. I moved to New York City to go to NYU to go to law school. I got into law school and I just realized I absolutely didn't want to go at all. And I was very lost. And so I started a blog to um, kind of document, you know, my, my path, finding what career I wanted. And through that, I learned a lot about digital marketing and I learned about how to have an online business. And then I started teaching others. And as it, as it kind of unfolded, it turned into the business I now have. So that's what I do. Oh, that's so cool. And how long have you been in business? Because this sounds like quite the runway you've been able to have to create for yourself. <laughs> I bought the domain for that blog. I think it will be seven years ago in March. So I started it in the beginning seven years ago, but there's sort of two start dates because I would say that the first two years were not really what I would consider a business. I sort of was just blogging. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just trying to create things, put myself out there. And then in 2017 is when I got, you know, more serious about it. So uh, the end of 2017, 2018. So that was five or six years ago now. Wow. And so as you've been building this business, you know, you, I'm guessing left behind a a different career. Uh, So you didn't go to law school, but like you left behind, tell us about that. And how did you make that transition? Yeah. So I, realized I didn't want to go to law school, but I didn't know what else I wanted to do. And I started my blog to sort of just document my journey being, uh, I felt very alone, but I felt like I wasn't alone. I felt like there were a lot of other millennials who had assumed that they would go to graduate school or law school or medical school or some sort of well-paved path because they thought that's sort of like what they should do or what would be admirable for them to do or what would make them fulfilled. And I realized I didn't want to do that. I wanted to kind of pave my own path, but I didn't really know what that looked like. So in the two years that followed after I started that blog, when I kind of referenced that I didn't really make it a business, I worked at a nonprofit. I traveled a little bit on my own. I looked at going to business school. I was still kind of kind of trying to get my feet wet with different career options, but I was growing this blog simultaneously. And, you know, I was starting to get this inkling that this could actually be a business and maybe I could work for myself. And maybe this was kind of what I was looking for. It took a while to really believe that though, you know, it almost felt too good to be true. And I didn't know the first thing and who was I to do that. And I had a bunch of imposter syndrome to work in, work through. And it wasn't until, uh, 2018, the beginning of it, when I unexpectedly lost my father, that I really started to take it seriously because, you know, his death put a lot of things into perspective for me, namely that I was kind of selling myself short and that I wasn't asking for enough of myself and of life. And so I really stepped into a new work ethic and just uh, perspective of how I was going to approach life and my career after that. And you know, a few months later, I was able to quit my nine to five. I totally went all in on my business and I've never looked back after that. Wow. I mean, it's so just amazing how something so tragic can also like wake you up to like the profundity of your life, you know, and and give you that courage and that boldness you needed to go after it. Um, Instead of being in the, you know, indecision or like the kind of wavering that we can often do. And I'm curious, how did alcohol play a role in this evolution that you've been on? Ooh, I don't know where to start. So I, looking back, can now think, now see that I, I don't know if I drank heavily, but I probably drank more than I would have had my father not passed. It was certainly something that I did after he passed away, but it was something I could had always kind of done casually and more socially. Um, and 
Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't, I'm not really sure where to start. It, it was not really something that stood out to me in the early years of my business. But then in 2021, the very first day of 2021, so a, a little over two years ago now, um, I had my last drink of alcohol. And I think it was a very good thing for my business. Yeah. I think it's such an interesting story because a lot of the women in my community um, are aspiring entrepreneurs or some of them already growing their businesses. Um, and I think for like in my story, for example, it was actually ditching alcohol that finally woke me up to the fact that I could go launch a business. You kind of have this little alternate story. You're a little ahead of us. You know, you got started into this dream um, and then you had this kind of profound realization to go bolder when your father passed, but then, you know, maybe you weren't taking care of yourself as much and the drinking kind of ramped up. So then you had this other awakening in 2020, right? So what happened then? And then what were kind of the results of like quitting drinking? Yeah. So up until I, qu I quit, I, I always say I didn't consider myself a heavy drinker, but I considered myself a frequent drinker. So I lived in New York and I just very much indulged in the sort of New York City way of living in your 20s. Lots of happy hours, lots of work events, lot, lots of networking, lots of you know nights out, um, fun, fun nights, things that truthfully I don't totally regret. You know, I think that there's a lot of like looking back on your days of drinking with shame and I, I don't really do that. But um, there was and there at the end, I just was doing it very frequently to the point where I was having glasses of wine, most nights with dinner or most nights when I was done with work or most nights when I would, you know, go out to have a drink with my husband. And so it was just a very frequent part of my life. So much so that when I look back, I really realized that I could not have imagined my life without it. And I know that that might sound codependent. It probably was codependent to be honest, if, you know, if I have the awareness around it now, but it was just such an ingrained deep part of me. My parents drank not heavily. I wouldn't say that they, you know, I came from like a problematic alcohol home, but it was very normalized. It was very okay. Um, as it was with really every kind of environment I had been in my whole life as it was in college, as it wasn't at work in New York and, um, and so on. And the biggest, I think, tipping point for me, or the thing that made me realize that this wasn't going to work anymore was sleep, ironically. So it wasn't that I did anything hugely shameful or that I had a horrible night or anything, but it was sort of just getting to this accumulation of, I wouldn't sleep through the night anymore. You know, even if I had like just two glasses of wine and I always had two, that's the truth. You know, some people are like, oh, well, couldn't you have just had one? And it was like, I guess I could have, but I didn't, I always had two. And I would, oh, and I just started like clockwork waking up at like two, three in the morning, you know, once the alcohol had left my system and I would just kind of lay there for like an hour or two. And it just really started to get to me. And it wasn't, it was like, I look back and I can just see how toxic it was because I used to lay there in my bed and, and I would like feel guilty about the fact that I drank or feel guilty about what I did or didn't say while drinking or did or didn't do. And I look back and it's like, it's not like I was out partying. I was just like at home with my husband or out with him or whatever, but that's what alcohol does to you is it just makes you anxious and it makes you stressed and it makes you doubt yourself. So even though I can look back clearly and see that I had no reason to feel those things, I couldn't see that clearly at the time. And so that was kind of happening and happening. And I think I just started to realize that if my, I knew my business was kind of on the cusp of something big. And I just felt like if I am not in the best, I, the best is kind of a, a lot of pressure, but like, if I'm not doing the most that I can to optimize my health, then there's a serious risk that this isn't going to work or that I'm not going to be able to handle this. And I think that in the business that I'm in, I work so closely with clients and their business. And it's very personal. I, I listen to their dreams and their goals and their finances and, and how they're talking to their partners about this. It's all very close to them. You have to hold a lot of space. And I felt like I was getting to a place where I didn't think I could hold it anymore because I had this lower level anxiety. I wasn't sleeping as well. I just wasn't optimally functioning. Um, and this all sounds kind of calculated. It was, it was more emotional than that. You know, it was kind of this like, I think that what I'm sharing was kind of the tip of the iceberg of something that had been boiling up for a long time, which is something in inner that I knew that this was, this was not a good thing, that this was going to either go poorly for me or end. And I couldn't see it ending. And I was too afraid to admit that to myself because I thought if I can't see this ending, then what does that mean? Um, so that was kind of the build up to it. And the, the day that I quit, um, you know, I'll never forget it. I remember that I was, 
it was New Year's Day and we were, I was on vacation and I just like clockwork had had two glasses of wine. It's not like I, it wasn't, you know, it was, I didn't go out crazy for New Year's Eve or whatever. And it was two in the morning and I was not sleeping. I was up in the middle of the night and I remember laying there and thinking, okay, well, you're on vacation for two more days. So you're for sure going to have some white claws for the next two days, but then you're going to go back to Miami. I was living in Miami at the time. And I was like, then you're going to go back to Miami and you can take a break and then you can, you know, rest, you can get your sleep back on track. But then I thought, no, but we have friends coming to visit. And so we're definitely going to drink then. And I was like, okay, well maybe after that. Oh, but no, then I have like this work thing. So I'm going to drink then. And so it was like, okay, I'm negotiating with myself in my head at two in the morning when I'm finally going to have a drink from alcohol so I can sleep through the night. And we're like three weeks out right now. And I don't see a, a break in sight. And it just really quickly went through my head. What if you just stopped? What if you just didn't drink anymore? What if that was the last one that you had last night? And I was like, okay, whatever. And I ended up just going back to sleep and kind of dismissing it. Cause it was such an outlandish thought, you know? I just couldn't see my life without it. I know you understand, like as crazy as it sounds now that I, you know, it's no big deal, but in the moment it felt so ridiculous. So I woke up the next morning and I was like, I'm, I might be onto something, but I had to go through all these mental gymnastics of like, but I'm on vacation. And like everyone around me knows that I drink. And what am I going to say if I don't drink? And like, what am I going to tell myself? And like, can I really imagine going through this dinner without drinking or the beach without white claws or all these things that were so ingrained in my mind? I didn't even think there were options anymore. And I listened to the book, Quit Like a Woman by Holly Whit Whitaker, it would, would take her, however you pronounce her last name. And I just remember walking on that beach and I just sort of like looked up into the sun and I was like, no, I'm going to listen to that. I'm going to listen to my gut and I'm going to not do this today. And that was the last drink I ever had. I never looked back. Wow. That's such an incredible story. And it just goes me, tells puts me back into the throes of like that mindset that, you know, was looking for an opportunity to just rest and get away from the cacophony of alcohol. And yeah. then it was like, oh yeah, but there's this and there's that. And there's yep. that. And it was like, it was like, it's not like I only drink socially. Like I drink at home too, but it's as if like those things kept me so stuck, you know, like, well, we have this on Friday and that. Right. And it was like, none of that was ever so important that I couldn't have <laughs> not been drinking at it, you know, but like, hallelujah, like you listen to that intuition and, you know, and I just am so impressed by the women who are both on the show and in this community, because it's like, it's not a sign of a problem. It's a sign of the deepest, loudest, intuitive voice that just knows you deserve so much better. You know what I mean? Like if two glasses of wine is doing this to women. And I thought I was alone. You know, I thought I was the only one waking up at 2am, right? How, right. why is no one talking about it? I and mean, right. now we are here, but back then I just didn't ever hear it. I thought I was completely just alone with that. You know what I mean? And it's like, we don't really speak the truth about alcohol, like in kind of mainstream society, you know what I mean? It's all things rosy and happy and stuff like that. And and it doesn't have to be this huge problem for us to just be like, wait a minute, are you not sleeping? Are you feeling that regret? Are you feeling all that type of stuff? So just kudos to you. And so like what happened afterwards and, you know, you've, you've built this incredible business and I'm just so inspired and in awe by you. Um, what happened in your business as well in the subsequent kind of months and years since that decision? Mm, well, thank you, first of all, for the compliment. And one of the reasons I'm so drawn to your brand is because what happened immediately after in the next like two to three weeks that followed were a complete sense of euphoria, something that I didn't expect at all, something that again, no one had like told me about. And I ended up looking it up and it is, I guess, in like the Alcoholics Anonymous or drug communities it, or recovery communities, it's called the pink cloud, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you know about that, but I, I didn't expect that, but it was so, I felt like I was floating on air. I felt like I was waking up just with the world at my fingertips every day. I, I didn't realize how how chained to alcohol or just how chained alcohol made me feel and how much of my freedom I had surrendered to it. And so I just remember feeling so supported by myself, you know, and cared for it by myself and loved by myself. And one of the thoughts that most stuck out to me during that time that I've really carried with me ever since was like, I remember how wealthy I felt, even though it had nothing to do with money. And I even remember, and, and I'm a business coach. So I work with people a lot on raising their income. I've worked a lot on raising my income. I've hit some crazy milestones if I do say so myself, but I almost went through this phase where it was like, that amount of money or whatever money that I make will never matter 
as much as this gift that I've given to myself. Like this is the most, this is the most important and valuable currency I've had, which is just a sense of self-respect, a sense of health, a sense of self-nurturing, um, a sense of self-love that was just so, so deep. So that has really stuck with me because I think it's helped me see that money is never the end game with your business, no matter what business you're in. Money is always the tool that you can use for the life that you want or the things that you want or what you want to give to your friends and family or the business that you want. And I think, especially in entrepreneurship, we can often get very obsessed with the number itself and not not and forget that it's not about the number itself. It's what the number means for our life. And I think that the, the, those first few in, initial weeks of sobriety was when it really kind of clicked for me. And it was like, this is, this is what I've been chasing. This is like the high that you want with money and income. Like this is this, I feel like I've arrived. And ironically, it kind of allowed me to let go of my intensity with my income goals. I still have income goals. You know, I think that that's completely healthy in business to kind of have a a projection of where you're going, but to recognize that those are just the means to the end, not the end helped me care more about how I was making it and feeling aligned with how I was making it and feeling clear about how I was making it and what I was doing to make it. And, you know, things in my life changed pretty dramatically after that. For starters, I got pregnant about eight weeks after I stopped drinking, which was incredible. And then I, my business had its first million dollar sales year when I was six months pregnant. So by all accounts, it was the best year of my life. I stopped drinking, got pregnant, hit a million dollars and had a baby all within a year. Wow. Yeah. It was amazing. And I, I I know that this might be a little bit of a sensitive topic, but I just think it's also good to be open about it. I, I attribute not drinking to not all of my pregnancy, but part of it, I do think that there's no way that that hurt my ability to get pregnant was, you know, cutting alcohol out. I know that there's plenty of women that drink a lot and they still get pregnant. And I know there's plenty of women who don't and they don't. So I'm not trying to be insensitive to fertility issues, but I do think that, um, I do think it helped me. And I, and I think it's something that I wish we talked more about because alcohol is horrible for your hormonal health. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a lot of studies that prove that, you know what I mean? And it's like, yeah. when you're already trying everything and that's just not something that's been looked at. It's almost kind of a disservice that it isn't talked about more, you know what I mean? Right. Just because exactly. of how much pain and frustration goes into that process. And it's like, oh, but you're fine having a drink, you know, like you'll see like blogs and doctors say that it's like, okay, but how does this make sense? Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of want to pivot a little bit because, uh, this is just amazing. And I'm just so curious that like, you know, people who are finding themselves in a, in a similar boat and when they're, you know, deciding that they, they're ditching alcohol, they want to step up to their life. You know, they want to grow a business, whether that's a nascent grit business that they're growing or the business that they've already had. And I think that like, sometimes like what you were saying a little bit earlier about how, like, is, could this really be that good to be true? You know, like, Mm -hmm. could this really be my life? is like, we don't see an easy way or a clear cut way sometimes to actually make the income we want, for example, especially like replacing a normal day job and stuff like that. So could you like really quickly just walk me through like, what is it that, because I think people who are on the outside Mm -hmm. kind of have a harder time recognizing that it's not rocket science to put offers out into the world and make money off of your talents, Mm -hmm. but I would kind of love to break it down. Like, what is it that your company sells? Like what kind of offers do you have out there and how has that evolved over time? Uh, just for someone else who might be, you know, putting their creativity hat on and wanting to really get out of that nine to five rut too. It's a great question. And the biggest, I think, pitfall or just way that we rob ourselves in that earlier phase of entrepreneurship where you feel like, you know, I've got something that I want to sell. I've got something I can do. I've got something I'm good at. How do I actually make money doing it? How can I actually make enough to get out of my nine to five? What in what in the world does this look like? is admitting to yourself that the offer itself is not enough. You have to, you have to market it. You have to get it out there. You have to be loud about it. You have to be consistent with it and you have to be clear about what problem it solves. So I think oftentimes the traditional business or side hustle advice talks about monetizing a skill that you have. Let's say that your skill or something that you love to do is your health coach, or maybe you're a personal trainer. That is a problem that you're solving 
which is the essence of any business. But if people don't know that you can solve that problem, then you're never going to make any money doing it. And what's hard is that a lot of people, like let's take my health coach example or personal trainer example, they don't know the first thing about marketing. They might not even like to market. They might not want to be on social media. They might not know how the algorithm works or email marketing or SEO or any of those sort of complex topics that aren't that complex, by the way, but just can seem a little bit foreign if you're not trained in them. Um, and so they sort of just stay in their zone of genius, but don't recognize how important it is to highlight and be loud, honestly, about what you're doing in order to make money doing it. So my business is, it specializes in marketing. And I think that why my business has been so successful and why my clients are so successful is because I don't think that you need to outsource marketing, but I also don't think you need to leave kind of your own zone of genius in order to overly market. And there's this simple middle ground where you can learn. I don't want to say, I do think they're somewhat simple, but you can learn just very aligned marketing strategies that help you get louder and clearer and more vis visible with whatever it is that you're selling so that you can make more money doing it, but you don't have to either outsource it and you, then you don't have to be the best kept secret either. So I think that's the hardest kind of pill for people to swallow is either they don't know marketing, they don't want to do marketing. They just kind of want to sell what they know how to do. And then it gets ugly because they're not selling enough of it because no one knows about it. They take it personally. This hurts their confidence. Then they're getting even less visible because they're feeling inconfident. So then they're making less money and it's a vicious cycle downward. So you really have to be on the defense here or on the offense, I guess I should say, and be proactive about putting yourself out there so that you don't get into this kind of like taking it personally place of your business not taking off. Yeah. Wow. That that's definitely something I've, I've gone through as an entrepreneur in my early days, you know, and it's, it's so interesting how like those expectations work. Um, I was just going to ask you what you think the biggest block is for most of the clients who come to you or like in the solutions that you help them with. Um, and obviously that one is a, is a really good one from early stage entrepreneurs. So I'm just curious, like, obviously there's a lot of the strategy and the technical and the tactical and all that kind of stuff, but it's like our mindset, like you said earlier, is sometimes where the biggest blocks are and the biggest hurdles are just maybe we're not allowing ourselves to go bigger or do something differently or whatever it is. So what do you think it is for your community? Like, what are you consistently helping women solve or mindset blocks to get over? It is all mindset. It is 90, 95% of success is what's in your mind. The actual acts that go into, like I have a seven figure business and what I actually do to make that money is relatively straightforward. I get on calls. I write a few emails. I post some, you know, fun reels that I took on my iPhone on social media. That stuff is not that hard. It's what goes on in your mind in between that. What will people think? Who am I to post this? What if I get rejected? What if this doesn't go through? What does that mean about me? It is pretty much all a mind game. So I think that there's a ton of different mindset blocks people come up against. They commonly are sorted into general buckets. The most common one amongst women is women is the fear of I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough to have this. I'm not good enough to create this. I'm not good enough to sell this. I'm not good enough to do this X, Y, and Z. Um, we live in a society that in many ways, conscious and unconscious tells women that and allows that to be true for them. So I think that different versions of that continue to come up in different parts of your journey. But I have to say that your community, anyone who has gone alcohol free, especially if alcohol was a big part of your life, and it's something you're proud of that you have um, either, you know, uh, completely released from your life or rethought, you know, and, and, and become healthier or just in a better place with it. That is an excellent metaphor for entrepreneurship because like I mentioned in my sobriety journey, in the beginning, I had this huge euphoric experience. I felt like I could fly. I felt better and more of a high than I ever felt from alcohol ever. Um, and, you know, and then that went away and I missed it. And I even remember talking to other people like that were in sobriety. And I was like, look, I, I like miss how good I felt. I miss how excited I was. I miss that kind of high, which is kind of weird, but like, I miss that, um, initial awe of how I felt and what I had to learn and what I had to sit with and discover is that 
it isn't that initial win or feel good that keeps you going through this. It is a true commitment and true dedication to yourself that this is what you want to do. This is what's important to you. This is what you value. And this is what you want your life to look like. And the real magic of sobriety didn't come from those early days and didn't come from that pink cloud. It has come from the accumulation of that commitment over two years and the continued self-respect I have to make that decision every day that I'm still not going to drink. And that is how entrepreneurship is. And I think a lot of times people chase that honeymoon phase of entrepreneurship where they first discovered they could work for themselves or they first got a sale or they realized they could quit their nine to five job. And that's so exciting. And then when they have phases where they're not making as many sales or they're not making as much money or they did get rejected, they start to get discouraged and they miss that high and they miss those wins and they miss that momentum. But where true growth comes from and a very successful foundation and a very impactful legacy comes from is not from those quick wins. It is from that daily commitment day in and day out that you want to work for yourself. You want to build something out of nothing. It is something that you really value and you're not going to throw in the towel even when it's not as fun. So if you've made that skill, something you can do in one area, apply that and you will have such an advantage. Oh, that's so true. And I could obviously use that lesson so much myself too. Like I love the way Tony Robbins sometimes describes goals. Like it's not really the goals that matter. It's who you become in the process, you know, because we just continue to put one number or metric or whatever in front of us. And just a silly example, like for maybe a year of dedicated effort, like we've been trying to get the like little blue check mark on Instagram. I was like, oh, I want it so bad, you know, like let's keep applying for it. And, you know, we kept getting rejected every single month. I'm not sure how their process works, but whatever. We finally got it. And I'm like, oh. Okay. And I don't really care. Like a day <laughs> and then you move on, you know what I mean? So it's so funny because it's just, it's not, it's such an external thing. It's not really that intrinsic, like, wow, I've really, really, you know, um, like you say that, that long-term commitment and that just fulfillment of seeing the whole kind of picture coming together, obviously celebrate all the wins, right? Yes. Celebrate everything. Um, but it's like, it's like, we can't get the highs from these, from these kinds of things. So I have right. one more question for you and it's kind of mirroring the business with the alcohol-free lifestyle. You know, there's so much marriage of like champagne and wealth mm. and, especially like in the business world for like masterminds and networking around alcohol. In fact, a lot of brands really build that alcohol piece, especially with like champagne into. (laughs) Hello, I am that brand. Yes. So I'm just curious now that you're alcohol free, is that something that is like apparent in, uh, you know, the culture kind of of your company? Um, And how do you navigate like that as kind of an expectation of those kind of like abundant seven figure, eight figure spaces where like, it's like the de facto is, you know, to have champagne because we're, we're all celebrating our success. Our richness. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm so glad you asked that. And I've thought about this a lot because my branding in and out before I went alcohol free was champagne day and night. I had it in every photo shoot. I did it in all my VIP days. I did it in all my retreats. And it was even something mentally that I really had to disassociate because I realized that I like associated alcohol with celebration and success. And, um, it was, you know, something I really had to undo here in my life in New York, because that's a big part of, uh, what I love about New York is kind of the, just everything it has to offer and all of the glamour that New York has. And a lot of that means glamorous bars, hotel bars, rooftop bars, all of those kinds of things. And I love a rooftop bar, still love a rooftop bar. Um, and so unwinding and kind of looking at how I associate like celebration and my success with alcohol was a big part of this journey. And I think a lot of people also, experience like unhealthy. No, I shouldn't say unhealthy. That's kind of a big word, but, um, incorrect correlations with food and success as well. Like they'll think that a decadent meal is like something that they should treat themselves to. And all of a sudden they feel unhealthy because they've treated themselves with, with food that they did not. To answer your question, In the beginning, I scrubbed my Instagram of um, pictures with me in champagne. I didn't want my brand to represent alcohol. I didn't want to be associated with it. It wasn't what I wanted to do. I didn't want to kind of push that agenda at all. Now I don't do that anymore. And I'll tell you why. 
One, mostly the kind of conclusion I've come to, let me be clear. I would never post something new with champagne because I don't drink anymore, but I don't, um, I don't tell my team that they can't use past pictures of me with champagne because the way that I see it is that the champagne was a representation of a celebration. And I still want my audience to celebrate their wins, big and small, no matter what that looks like for them. So because I'm so open about my sobriety and because I talk all the time about having gone alcohol free, I think that I have been very clear about the fact that that's more about symbolism than it is about anything else. Um, but it's still something I kind of have to sit with because I don't actually think alcohol is a good thing to celebrate with. I think it's a terrible thing to celebrate with because it's doing terrible things to you. And so I, I always have to try to kind of mitigate my own message with it. And it, it's caused a lot of internal conflict. So to answer your question, yes, it's complicated to also answer your question. There's a lot of branding that uses alcohol when it talks about hitting six figures, seven figures, masterminds, glamour, private jets, what have you. But if you really talk to a lot of seven figure business owners, most of them don't drink. Mm. That's what I've actually found is like, it's all pretty in branding, but when you really get down to the nitty gritty of it, I, I have found over and over that my very high achieving, high earning colleagues and friends and mentors, they actually don't drink. Yeah. That is so refreshing to hear. And I think it's so refreshing too, for like, there is a growing number of women who are identifying as alcohol free or sober curious where they don't want alcohol to be the main focus. And it can often be even a turnoff to be like, do I have to go to this thing where we're just going to like, it's just going to really be a drinking fest and not really totally. like a business, you know, thing. Um, and sometimes not obviously most people, but like, sometimes you really can feel the disconnect. Like, wait, we're talking about health and we're talking about right. integrity and we're talking about self-love and we're talking about all this stuff. And then we're talking about getting drunk. Like th totally. this person does not, something is off here. Right. So sometimes you can even see it and feel it when that like thought leader hasn't yet quite reconciled how they might feel about alcohol too. So I just think it's so refreshing to hear that, that like you're taking a stand for that, obviously. And, and just being loud about your alcohol free lifestyle doesn't mean like, like you said, like there's still symbols and stuff like that, but, and also sharing that a lot of movers and shakers in the society don't drink because that's also been my kind of, uh, experience and at least the ones I look up to the most, you know what I mean? And yeah. that's also like what really inspires me to be alcohol free is like, this isn't some kind of stigma or prison sentence or right. weakness. It's actually like the secret to success. You know what I mean? And all exactly. these people figured it out and I'm going to be with them. <laughs> totally. But I think that up until recently, those people figured it out for a while, but didn't talk about it because it's so stigmatized. And because people think if you don't drink, then it must be because you're an addict or you have an alcohol issue or you can't handle it. And so mm -hmm. It's both vulnerable and exciting to be on the kind of, I don't want to say like I'm plowing the way because there's many women who have gone before us who, you know, have really started the conversation, but it is exciting to be kind of in this movement of like elected sobriety. Sobriety is a key to success. It's something I'm very proud of. And I talk a ton about it. And um, it's also one of the first things I'll ask people if they're feeling really anxious or if they're feeling really stressed about business, it's like, and I don't, I don't like saying it like, are you drinking? Right. Cause no one's going to respond well to that, but it's like, are you taking care of yourself? Are you eating? Are you, uh, exercising? Are you really nourishing your body? And then you can kind of peel away and insinuate, like you said, and I was the walking example of that. I was so into exercise and fitness and I ate well, and then I would drink every night. And it's like, well, how does this, how does this make any sense? So I think that, I think that the tides are turning a lot and people are starting to realize, and for the record, just if anyone's listening, I mean, I think your audience probably is mostly alcohol free at this point. I still like going to bars. I still love bars in New York. I love going to rooftops. It is still something I enjoy doing that social aspect of the city. I just don't drink anymore. And I think that's like what, like having the cake and, or eating your cake and having it too. Like there, it really, you can have both. You can like have all the same glamorous events and experiences. I just went to wine country the other month, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like I deny myself these beautiful or glamorous experiences. It's just like, just don't put this type of liquid up to your mouth. It's that simple. There's other totally. liquids. <laughs> and in fact, the experience is so much better because you don't feel awful after it. 
Yeah. Uh, well, Leah, I love this like super nuanced, honest, vulnerable, and just empowering conversation with you. Um, we're going to go ahead and put all of the links to your website and your Instagram in the show notes. So go check her out. Um, is there anything else you would like to share? How about this one last question? What are your goals for 2023? Just in a quick <laughs> sound. My bite. big goal, and this is something I never could have done if I didn't quit drinking, is to run the New York City Marathon. Wow. That is my biggest goal of the year. I am not a runner. I also just had a baby a few months ago, not a few months ago, but like 12 months ago now. So this is physically putting my body in an, an unusual and unfamiliar territory. But that is my big goal of the year. Wow. Super inspiring. Well, good luck with that. Enjoy it. Have fun training. <laughs> Thank you so much. What's your goal for the year? Can I ask you back? Am I allowed to ask you on your own podcast? Yes, of course. Um, so we want to double our income. That's a good goal. Yes. From last year's income to this year's income. So you can do this. You have a blue shiny <laughs> check and a new book. If anyone can do this, you can do this. Oh, thank you so much. Yes. I was like, what, which goal? Cause I do definitely have a few, but yeah, that was the first one that came to mind. <laughs> Hell yeah. I'm cheering awesome. you on. I think it's like also just refreshing for me to talk about like wealth goals and, and business growth goals, because it's not something I am used to doing, especially because this podcast is so much about being alcohol free, but mm -hmm. I think it's just so common for women to be stepping into, you know, their passion projects or businesses as they go alcohol free. And I think we need to, as women also own like our dreams and really be like claim more power and claim more wealth and richness and all that kind of stuff too. So I'm practicing that. Good for you. And I couldn't agree more. There's nothing stigmatized. It's ridiculous that we feel like we can all drink publicly, but like talking about your income goals is weird. <laughs> In what way does that make sense? That sounds like a product of the patriarchy. If I've ever heard. Oh one. man, that's a good one. That's a good soundbite. All right, Leah. <laughs> well, it was such a pleasure to have you on the show. I hope you have a great rest of your evening. You too. Thank you so much for having me. Happy new year. Happy new year.